Okay, welcome to the Siri uh, webinar series um, for the this one's uh, for the month of July, um, and today's uh, webinar will be uh, is entitled Inf "Influence of Climate Change on Texas Pavement Infrastructure." Um, Change a little bit. Uh, no, well, <laughs> I guess you did. Uh, anyway, the uh, okay the. Impact Assessment of Hydro-Meteorological Events on Texas Pavements and Development of Resiliency Strategy, a much more academic sounding uh, title for the webinar, so thank you very much for that. Um, so changing climate, as we all know, can, ex can cause extreme weather events, uh, whether it's uh, additional rain, uh, substantially more rain uh, than we expect, storms and temperature patterns. Um, these changes, of course, can have an Im adverse impact on the performance of pavement systems, particularly in a state like Texas, where it is very, uh, very hot and very dry. Um, and so um, estimating the, po the potential effects of this climate change on the pavement systems is really important uh, to help the uh, transportation officials to make uh, sound decisions to accommodate this climate change in, in their planning and design of pavement systems. So the objective of the presentation today is uh, to show that anticipated change in climate and its impact on the performance of uh, uh, pavement systems and infrastructure in the state of Texas. Our presenter today is Dr. Vivek Tandon, who is a professor of civil engineering at the University of Texas at El Paso. He's teaching and conducting research in the field of highway infrastructure um, he has a Master of uh, Science degree from the University of Texas, El Paso, and a doctorate uh, from the Pennsylvania State University. Uh, the main focus of his research is in the area of development and evaluation of innovative, sustainable materials for highway infrastructure, um, th those mater the materials that will generate um, a minimal carbon footprint as well. Um, a minor area of his expertise includes evaluating the impact of extreme climate events on transportation infrastructure um, and sustainable development approaches for smart cities. Uh, Dr. Tandon came here to, uh, this summer um, as a result of the uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, summer research uh, team program. Um, and that program from uh, the Department of Homeland Security is designed to increase and enhance the scientific leadership at minority serving institutions such as the University of Texas El Paso um, in the area in research areas that support the mission and goals of uh, the Department of Homeland Security. And the program provides faculty and student research teams with the opportunity to conduct research at university based DHS centers of excellence, um, such as the uh, Critical Infrastructure Resilience Institute here at the university. So without any further ado, let me turn it over to uh, Dr. Tandon. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Randy, for the introduction. Uh, I just wanted to show how UTEP looks like. Many of you have not visited or have seen it. It's based on Bhutanese architecture. It started long time ago, and all the buildings pretty much have the similar structure over there. And uh, basically, we have maintained this one for quite a while. Uh, basically, when I started working on the presentation, I, I did not knew the uh, expertise of different people uh, in this uh, particular presentation, because when I came here, I saw some interns who are in computer science and so forth, and Siri is also focusing mainly on cyber and things like that. So that's one of the challenge I have. Let's see how it works out, because the crowd is different. I see some civil engineers, but I see some non-civil engineers as well. Uh, so basically what I did is when I wrote the proposal to uh, uh, DHS, uh, I had some research done on the climate change. So that's what I have put it there first. And then when I spent some time here, and worked with the, um, Dr. Gardoni's group, I have developed some uh, new understanding and new thought process that can be used for furthering the research I was doing and expanding on the knowledge we have. So the first part, I'm gonna talk about 
what we did for Texas Department of Transportation and then what we are proposing to do in the future. So for Texas funded study, we had a problem and we developed some approach and we used some climate data and so forth and we came up with some probabilistic analysis and had some conclusions on it. So basically, if you look at it, we have an issue. So there are two issues. One is the weather pattern is changing. That means there are more and more uh, uh, kind of um, increase in the temperature, uh, more precipitation, as well as some extreme events like Hurricane Harvey. Now, if you remember, it was there for a while uh, where uh, the storm continued to stay in Houston area, and that created a lot of problems. Now, keep in mind is that extreme events like Harvey are typically cannot be generated or identified using climate models, okay? So that's one of the challenges as well, that how to go ahead and look after these kind of issues. So we can do the simple things here, but these kind of things are, the models are not there at this point to predict that kind of climate. So let me go ahead and say what we were looking at it. So first we had to spend some time on developing an understanding of the climate change because the, uh, I'm not a climate science person and there are a bunch of different climate models which are available that are projecting for the future. So, so far the design has been based on historical weather pattern. That means whatever weather we had in the past, we have the information, we use it for the design, but in the future things are changing. So climate science people, they say it is the design based on historical data is not good enough because you are driving while looking in the rear view mirror and that means you are not seeing in the future. So there are many different models available and when we started uh, we had this one as well as this one but this is the latest one however it doesn't have some of the information what we need and basically these are the global ones, then we go ahead and create regional ones. And this is the range we are looking at it right now. So what we went ahead and did is, is selected the older version and A2 storyline series. And the reason we did it is because we needed to have the data needed for the software. So we were relying on the software and the software expected us to have X amount of data. And we also have to have a lower resolution as compared to global models. And these are the models we looked at it. Uh, there is no need typically for this kind of uh, slide, but I put it there because somebody says, what is CRCM? And so I don't remember it. There are a bunch of them, so I just put it there in case somebody needs to know about those ones. So basically you have global climate models and you have regional climate models. So we can go ahead and take a look at both of them over there. And so one of the things which I wanted to show you is this is the historical. So basically we have the historical climate data and it's representing certain areas. Now if you look at it, for the future one, it's one of the models, and you can see that the weather pattern is slightly changing, and in this area you have more hot weather, and here and so forth. So the way it is, is the weather pattern is changing, and we have to figure out how to deal with that weather pattern. And the other thing which we have is, the, now keep in mind is, the newer models, they don't have this bias but the, we are looking at 2008 2 storyline that has uh, some bias. So what you can take a look at it is that this is the data we have from predicted one. However, this is what we have 
from the weather stations. So we have a weather station data which is slightly higher as compared to the predicted one. So climate models have both options. You can predict the future as well as you can go back in the past. So we are comparing in the past and you can see that there is a difference. So we have to bias correct it upwards and the same thing we did it here. This is for the temperature and this is for precipitation. And it is the same thing, we had to go ahead and adjust our predictions. So the way it is is that the older models have some flaws in it and we have to take into account how we're gonna do that. And then this is what I'm gonna make a statement because once we go to the next slides, you're gonna see that there is a difference. So what it says is all models are wrong, but some are useful, okay? So basically these are statistical models that may or may not represent actual conditions, but there is an attempt to go ahead and show the differences. So this is what you have. This is a monthly mean temperature, and it's showing you here, you can see that the models are predicting differently. So this is, the red line one is the one which we have from the weather stations and these are the predicted ones. So you see that some people are saying, well, we're gonna have milder temperatures. Some people are saying we're gonna have increase. Some people are saying we're gonna have reduction. So that's the weather models we got. And then, you know, you can go ahead and put the same thing for different locations in Texas, okay? So this is Amarillo that's in up, up north in the Panhandle. McAllen is down south towards uh, Mexico and so forth. And every model has a little bit different prediction. And this is for monthly annual precipitation. And you can see the annual precipitation is significantly higher than what we have anticipated in the past. And similarly, mean annual wind speed. Again, software has a requirement, but it doesn't make a whole lot of a difference in terms of the wind speed on the pavement performance. So we can go ahead and just not worry that much about it. Then you have relative humidity. If you have a higher relative humidity, that means you're gonna have more rainfall and so forth. So that's another data set we have. Okay, so this is for people who are not civil engineers. All of us, we drive. And so we have two type of pavements. One is called flexible, other one is called rigid. Okay, rigid is the one which you have Portland cement concrete on top of it, and it's a little bit more noisy and asphalt concrete has, uh, asphalt concrete on top of it, there can be different layers, it's less noisy, so if you are driving on the road, especially in Illinois, we have jointed pavements, you can drive and say here, after a certain time, tadam, tadam, tadam. So you are going from one slab to another one, and that's what it has over there. So you have a flexible and rigid, we looked at the flexible only. And this is what is called rutting again for non-civil engineers that this is the rutting. So basically you can see the tire imprint, imprint is there. So that's what is happening. So you have a damage in the pavement. And then you have something called IRI, International Roughness Index, that tells how rough the road is. So if the roughness is higher, that means road requires some sort of maintenance in there. And that's what, these are the two parameters I'm gonna talk about uh, today in the lecture uh, presentation. So basically, this is what we have. So in order to go ahead and model the climate change, uh, weather change and so forth, we have to use a software which is called Pavement ME that is developed by Federal Highway Administration. And so basically we go ahead and use that particular software and we go ahead and put some uh, probabilistic analysis in the end. We can go ahead and modify the parameters to see how it's gonna look like. So in order to do that, we selected a frontage road 
this in IS-30, Interstate Highway 30, that's near uh, Fort Worth area. And this is what you have, it has an asphalt concrete which is four inches, you have a cement treated base material, and you have a subgrade, this one is around 15 inches. It has a type D mix, that's the mix they use in Texas. It has performance grade 70 minus 22 asphalt. Uh, that's uh, again commonly available. This is the modulus value and this is the modulus value of the subgrade. And basically we said around 3.6% uh, percentage is the uh, truck traffic and this is the total traffic you have over there. We did it for a bunch of other uh, uh, roads as well, but I'm not gonna talk about it here. So if I go ahead and take a look at it, we get something like this. This is IRI, that means International Roughness Index. And what it is is if you go above 160, 172 means that needs, needs, uh, road needs to be totally rehabilitated. But in Texas, what they say it is around 100 inches per mile. If you have IRI this much, that's where you're gonna go ahead and do some maintenance. So if you look at this particular one, you can see that the maintenance years will change, okay? So it can be eight and a half years rather than 9.5 years, or in some cases, uh, you're gonna get the benefit because the weather is not uh, that much uh, harsher, it is more milder. Then if I look at the asphalt concrete rutting, so that's 0.4 inches is a threshold, you have to start doing something, and again, you can see it's going from 15.8 to six years. So that means that I may have to do a maintenance earlier, or I may have to go ahead and do something, so that will become an expensive exercise. And again, the models are giving you different numbers. So then we also went ahead and said, again, we are relying on the model which is in the software, that if we have an extreme rainfall like Harvey, we're gonna have saturation of our subgrade material that will create problems. And basically we said it happens is one year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years of service, and its saturation will last for seven and a half days, 15 days, one month and two months. And so once we go ahead and do that, there is some difference, but the difference is minimal. We are just looking at one particular uh, model here, uh, CRCM1, and we found that it's there, but it's not that much major. And if I go ahead and look at base and subgrade rutting, again, there is an influence but it's not that much significant. And we didn't find any difference whether we have saturation for seven and a half days, 15 days, and so forth. So we go ahead and take a look at IRI. Again, it's not a major change over there. However, we see some drop in the subgrade modulus, but keep in mind is we are talking about very minimal, uh, minimal amount. So the model is not uh, truly representing or it cannot handle that particular aspect. And we can also go ahead and say we are looking at extreme conditions as well as we are looking at uh, uh, climate change data and we can see now there is some difference. So the way it is is we are artificially creating a saturation in the subgrade and we are using modified climate files. So we see there is some difference. Now, how you can mitigate some of these things, that means you can adapt to the change in climate and so forth, we can go ahead and do different kind of things and we can increase the thickness of AC layer and so forth and we can go ahead and change the mix type and things like that. So there are a bunch of different options available. And here is some of the information we gathered. So basically mix type will govern asphalt concrete rutting and you can see depending on what mix we go ahead and select, we can get a different performance. 
if I look at IRI, it's not changing that much, but AC rating is changing. So we can go ahead and select a particular mix type, which will be beneficial over there. Uh, and basically, we can also go ahead and change the thickness of our, of our asphalt concrete layer, and you can see that will also change. So we have some tools which can be used to improve the performance. And in the end, we went ahead and did some Monte Carlo simulation for probabilistic analysis, and we have some of the climate models here, future simulations, we did some bias correction, and this is for precipitation, this is for temperature. And if I go ahead and do the analysis, it seems that the failure can happen for AC rutting. It may or may not happen for IRI. So the way it seems like that with the climate change, the more emphasis is on asphalt concrete, and that's what the models are predicting for us over there. So do you guys have any questions? I think this is where I want to stop before I go further. Yes. Yeah. I have a question about um, how do you determine the IRI? Okay, so there is a formula there that looks at the cracking, that looks at the rutting. So there is a something called profiler that goes ahead and measures what's the differences between the two wheel sites, and then it goes ahead and does the calculations. So you can do profile as well as you can, they, there is like how much cracks you have, how much rutting you have, it's a combination of the things that does that, okay? Other questions? No? Okay, so basically, now this is what, after I got done with this study, I said, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do some improvement. But then, these are the problems they come in. So in Texas itself, you have around 73,000 miles of highway. And if I assume just two lanes, I will be spending, and I want to go ahead and add an inch layer of asphalt concrete, it will cost us $20 billion. Okay, now if I want to go ahead and improve the bridges and so forth, it's gonna cost more. So then what happens is I have to do something because if I want to ignore the change in climate and change in weather, it's not gonna help us. But if I want to have it, that's where it becomes a problem because it becomes a costly exercise. So that's where I was looking at it and saying, can I go ahead and do something related to critical pavement infrastructure? So the, my idea was to identify critical pavements rather than the whole pavement structure or critical bridges in the end rather than just uh, a whole uh, number of bridges. In Texas, I believe there are 50,000 uh, bridges. Okay, so that's a lot of effort over there. So that's where I came here and uh, we spent uh, quite a good amount of time reading. I haven't read that many reports or pay papers in two months, than what I did here. But that was kind of a mind opening at the same time. It gave me an idea how or what I need to do it over there. So basically, we talk about resiliency, and I was reading the reports in the papers. They said resiliency started in the 70s and so forth. And I realized that we have been using resiliency for a very long time. That's what we do in civil engineering or materials. I guess the materials is the right number. So basically what happens is if I am this, in this range and I take the area under this curve, I get modulus of resilience. And so overall idea is that if the stressor is below this one, it's gonna absorb any extreme event. If it goes beyond it, then you can have something like this, that you have some strain hardening, so you have some improvement, you recovered, and you get the performance this way. 
So basically, we have been using resiliency for quite a while. That we are not using in the same terms, but for the materials we have, the same concept. So many people have come up with different definitions. I'm going to go through some of it. So basically, the idea is that you have a critical functionality. Everything is fine here. You have an extreme event. And then you have a recovery. How fast, uh, how easy it is, that's a very different thing. And then you have a threat, vulnerability, and consequences, and that's the risk you are looking at it. Then somebody is saying is that, do we want to have a smart system or resilient system? And these are the two different definitions they came up with. <coughs> and what he's saying it is, this is resilient. Because if this link is broken, you have other links working. But here, if something is broken, then other ones are gone. So basically, that's what uh, we hear for electricity and so forth, the smart grids and things like that. So the thing is, it is less efficient, but it is more resilient. It is more efficient, but it may not be resilient in case of some extreme events and so forth. Then some other people have came up with, we need to have a sustainable system where recovery is quick. This is called unsustainable system. That means it takes longer, or the functionality reduces significantly before it starts going up. Okay? So this is what it seems like we have to think in the long term in terms of resiliency. So you have four dimensions of resiliency, technical, organization, social, economic. And then you have more reliability, you have faster recovery, and you have lower consequences. And you have robustness, rap rapidity, redundancy, resourcefulness. So this is, again, the people have different layers, levels, and so forth, but they are getting to something similar here. So this is what we should be looking at it in terms of resiliency, and I'm going to try to define resiliency in terms of transportation infrastructure using this particular concept, and that's the proposal I'll be submitting to DHS for um, subsequent funding. And then, so basically the way it is, is if I want to go ahead and look at resiliency of critical transportation infrastructure, we need to have accumulate information, or that's what is called transportation asset management. And we have to identify critical components of infrastructure. And we need to develop a resilience assessment strategy for selection of uh, and mitigation. And then we have to have some decision-making framework. Because the problem becomes is that when we go ahead and do all those things, we have to make sure that we have some alternatives and we are making decisions which are making sense. Because there are two things you have to keep in mind. Is one is multi-criteria. And when we are de doing a group dis uh, decision, because we're going to have some social aspect, you're going to have some economic aspects, you're going to have some environmental aspect. So you have different groups of people, they have different priorities, and that creates a different problem for us. So we need to have a group decision making process where we can go ahead and make a decision on selecting the right strategy. So uh, basically, again, this is uh, transportation asset management. Most of the agencies, they have it. That's how they go ahead and do it. And Federal Highway Administration has kind of uh, blessed it that this is how we should be collecting data. So we need to have the pavements, bridges, that have all the information related to performance and so forth. And so that's what they are using in terms of making decisions. So this is how they figure out, OK, my IRI is bad. We need to repair this particular roadway. Or we have some cracking in here, or we have some rutting, and so forth. Or the, in terms of the bridges, you have a scour depth and things like that. 
So you have to go ahead and think in that particular terms over there. So in terms of identifying critical infrastructure, and that's what I have been struggling with, and if you see here is, this is the El Paso area. So you have an I-10 that's Interstate 10, and it goes up there. And then this is the urban area, this is El Paso, and this side you have Mexico. And what you have is, there is a Loop 375 that is coming this way. But, and then you have some 85 coming this way, but if you go ahead and look at this area, that's where, that's the only major highway. So if something happens here, it creates traffic problems. So then this can be considered to be a critical infrastructure that we can go ahead and say this is the road we're going to follow and we're going to make sure that we invest our money, our resources in this particular road. We make sure that there is no failure occurs. That's one way to go ahead and take a look at it. Now this is, I know it because I've been living there and so forth, but many times we don't know about these roads and so forth, okay? It becomes very difficult for everybody to know every single thing. So that's one way of identifying a critical transportation infrastructure. And the other way, this is what um, uh, Roberto came and told me the research he has been doing, that we can go ahead and create nodes and so forth, and create links and figure out which is the critical one, whether we have alternate paths and so forth or not, and then, he also showed me that it can be something like that where we are looking at dependency. So that means you have a road network, but you have other aspects. So basically, you can have other issues that you have a drainage problem that is not considered, okay? You can have a overfill over the top of flooding and that damages or does not allow your bridge to function and so forth. So you have to also look at interdependency. So these are the two things which uh, I think I'll be trying to work with uh, Dr. Gardoni and uh, uh, Roberto uh, to see how we can go ahead and utilize it for identifying critical infrastructure. The other one is, this is what, again, uh, going through the literature search, I found it that uh, they have done something called urban road efficiency modeling is done by Army Corps of Engineers. And what you have is here, A is the uh, Los Angeles area, and D is the San Francisco area, okay? They looked at the demographics, they looked at the traffic pattern, and so forth, and they went ahead and identified the issues here, and this is where they are coming up and saying that we have a problem, so we have a problem on these roads because these are critical. You have a traffic jam and so forth. So if you have an event where you are asking people to leave the town, let's say a similar thing happened for Harvey when uh, people are supposed to leave Houston, then you will have something like this one. So they are saying it is that this can be a critical infrastructure for us, okay? So there is a way to simulate some of these things. So I'm not sure that all these three things, which one will be giving us the right information. So that's where I need to spend some time and figure out how we can do this particular aspect. But again, they looked at uh, it was a big data uh, performance for them because they looked at different um, uh, high, uh, uh, different demographics, looked at the different patterns, and they simulated that condition. So that's another way to go ahead and take a look at it. You can identify a problem location, and then using that problem, you can ask the people to go out. So if something happens at UIUC, everybody has to go then do we want to find out what is the chokehold. 
and that chokehold is very well maintained and it is resilient to the threats. So that's the crucial thing, that's the critical infrastructure we are trying to shoot for over there. And we can go ahead and use this kind of uh, information. So you have a stressor, any kind of things, and then you can go ahead and look at the system, look at its resilience, and then go to the management and go back and forth. So that's kind of a uh, flow chart that helps you in getting in this particular directions. And then I guess uh, we need to have, after we are done with these kind of things, we need to have some assessment strategy. How are we gonna assess our transportation infrastructure in terms of its resiliency? So we have identified critical transportation infrastructure, but we have to have some assessment strategy. And so since it's backwards, I'm gonna go ahead and put it this way. So I have two slides that shows you. So you have some technical aspects, and this is developed by New Zealand uh, Transportation Agency. We can go ahead and work on it in terms of the US transportation and see how it can be used. So basically, we can come up with some sort of a score, and using that score, we can give some numbers. So if you look at the next slide, you have organizational and so forth, and of course, we have to keep in mind, we have to use some social aspects as well. So we have a assessment strategy for our infrastructure. And then this is what, I guess, in civil engineering, we don't talk about it, is the money part, okay? We don't have courses, I believe we have uh, at UTEP something called Economics for Engineers and Scientists. That's about it. There is nothing more than that. But anytime you want to do something, it is very costly. And there is a cost associated. So we have to have some component in there that says, okay, how much it will cost? And you keep in mind is, if you keep on reducing the risk or minimizing the risk, cost goes up. And you may not get the benefit. And that's what the managers who will allow to you to do make changes or to come up with the policies, things like that, they're gonna look at it. Everybody will say, how much is gonna cost me? How much is gonna cost me? So that's what we have to include in our critical infrastructure resiliency strategy. So that's another thing which I thought it's important and we need to include in the assessment. Then this is what I felt that we need to add that one there is, this is kind of a decision model we have to develop. And basically what happens is we have a multi-criterion and we have a group decision. So group decision, it will have finances, it will have uh, social people, it will have uh, engineers, and of course you will have managers over there who will make a decision on what money will be spent and where it will be spent. And then what kind of criterion we're gonna select. So we have resilient assessment strategy, we can go ahead and use it to go for multi-criteria. Now, in order to make a decision model, typically we go ahead and we go ahead and say we're gonna use AHP. This is a common one which is used in civil engineering by transportation people. Uh, and this is, has been used. Uh, basically the problem with this one is that sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, it creates problems. So what it is is we have to go ahead and create some sort of analysis in the end. And usually we go ahead and go for arithmetic or geometric mean. And we occasionally end up asking or manipulating individual decisions. Uh, because you know they are biased in certain areas and that creates a problem. 
So basically what happens is if I invite a social science person to go ahead and give me the input and I don't use the input, they don't like it, okay? Because that's not what they are expecting. So that becomes a problem. So what happens is that we can go ahead and use or modify this one using some data envelopment analysis and basically it has some complex calculations and so forth. And I just put this equation here to keep Dr. Gardoni happy. He likes the Greek words and so forth. But again, we can use some linear programming model to go ahead and eliminate that particular problem. And again, you can also have some constrained optimization techniques as well that can help. And so this is what can be done. Sorry. I guess oh, this one is not very clear anyways. So basically what happens is that you have AHP, you go ahead and modify using some of these parameters and come up with a group decision model. So that's kind of a thing that will help in terms of making a decision that okay, we need to use this particular uh, alternative that is the solution for us. Okay, so that's what I'm proposing over here. And then this is an example, that's how it can be portrayed. This is from uh, uh, coastal resource management. You have different parts over there and you figure out which one is the right decision for you. So the idea is that I'm trying to look at it and global or holistic approach rather than just focusing on a particular component. So it has involvement from different areas and then we can put it together and say, okay, this is how we're gonna identify the critical infrastructure. This is how we're gonna mitigate it. This is how we're gonna assess it. And this is how we're gonna go ahead and model it. So that's what my, uh, I am thinking about it and that's what I'm gonna put it together to submit to DHS and I have to work with uh, uh, Dr. Gardoni to make sure he is okay with that one. Apparently he's out of town today and tomorrow. So after he comes back, we'll work on that particular aspect. With that, I conclude my presentation and uh, I have left some time to answer questions. Hi. Uh, hi, Professor Tannen. Thank you for your presentation. So I have a question regarding the um, mitigation strategy. Because yes. what we probably are interested in is, um, as you mentioned, uh, the cost benefit uh, part of the mitigation. So if yeah. we have different strategies, which one would be a, a, a better option? Yeah. But when we are considering which stra mitigation strategy would be better, it is associated with the uncertainty related to the, uh, the outcome uh, regarding implementing mitigation and also without implementing the mitigation. Uh, but in, um, in your first part of the presentation, you show the pr projections of the climate uh, yes. impact or influences uh, in the future, but these are kind of like a point estimates. So how about the uncertainty level? So basically, uh, you can go ahead and do, uh, now this is a um, new things coming up, is uncertainty quantification. You have, if you have access to uncertainty quantification in uh, climate models, you can input it there, or you can use uncertainty quantification in the pavement performance. So what we had done is we had developed some system dynamic models, I, I didn't show it here, but that one had some equations and we can use some uncertainty quantification to be included in there. So there is a possibility we can go ahead and do that uncertainty quantification in the prediction. 
Thank you, Professor. You have to switch it on, yes. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, Professor. Yes. I had a doubt regarding these natural calamities that occur. So things like these which come under Poisson distributions, so how do you handle them in your simulations? Okay, so basically there is no model that can simulate. There is no climate model that can simulate it. So then you have to go for different level of estimation. So the, the model which we use, the pavement ME, it doesn't have that option. So for instance, now what is happening in California, right? We have a fire hazard. How it is influencing our uh, pavement, there is no model for it. So that means we have to look at individual ones. So depending on the area, so like in El Paso, it's totally dry. We won't have a fire hazard. Okay, so uh, if you are in Hawaii, you have volcano. So you have to decide on the stressor and see that stressor will give you information. And then you can go ahead and go from there. So it is very hard. There is uh, the pavement ME model we have. It doesn't have that capacity. So I cannot predict it. Now these are extreme events happening at a time. So you have to look at the previous data and see what will be the impact on the pavement. The other way to take a look at it, that if you can generate, so basically, uh, let's see, this is what can be done. And that's why I was saying identifying the critical infrastructure. So for example, this one, right? So you are trying to create a stressor. So if you go ahead and say, you have a fire in this area, how people will behave, how the traffic will move. Now keep in mind is, there are social aspect. Because right now what is happening is, I was just reading today, that uh, people, since they have Uber pool, there is more traffic congestion. Or everybody gets on Google map and decides to follow, so everybody is going in that particular path. So that will be a very difficult and challenging aspect to do it. But you can create a simulation like this one and say, okay, I'm having here, and this is the fire, so where people will be going. And if this particular road or section of the road becomes congested, or it will become a problem that will not allow people to leave, maybe I need to go ahead and have a redundancy. That means create a separate lane. So whether prediction models, they are not able to predict, and the pavement ME software we have is not able to handle everything. So that, that will be an aspect. So we have to worry about that particular concept. Yes. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question was on this critical model you've developed to identify critical roads. How correlated are they to the ADT? Or in other words, is it correct for me to say that busy roads tend to be critical roads? See, uh, again, keep in mind is when you have interstate, right? We know it has a high traffic. And that's where the maximum amount of money is spent. Okay? So they are continuously monitoring it. Or they are con continuously maintaining it. So we, we, we know what's going on in there. But when you have a special case, so that's what I was talking to Roberto when I was looking at it. So let's say you have a hospital, right? In the case of emergency, hospital has a redundancy, they have a generator, they have X number of doctors and so forth. But a road, if it is washed out, okay? then people cannot get to the hospital. So now that becomes a critical infrastructure. So that's what the simulation component is. So you have to start looking at it and start simulating and figuring out that, hey, this particular section. So it is not kind of a easy exercise because there will be a lot of computational time. You have to spend a lot of energy on figuring it out, but we have to start thinking in that direction if we want to go for resiliency. 
Because resiliency means is the functionality doesn't go away. And we cannot go ahead and upgrade every single bridge. We cannot upgrade every single road. We cannot create drainage for every single road. So there, the, those are the things that have to be explored to figure out which is my critical infrastructure. And you spend the energy and money on it. Because as I said, that typically most of the highways in the US are funded by gasoline we buy, right? Now we have electrical cars, right? So Tesla is taking away some of that funding. You have hybrid cars, they are taking it away. You have efficient cars, they are taking away that money. So then your resources are shrinking, your highways are expanding, and if we have the weather patterns, what we had this year, I remember somebody telling that we did not had like a, a spring, we had a snow season, and then we had just a hot season. So then, if you have a snow, you're gonna do the snow removal, right? That is a costly exercise. So you have less resources. And then you go ahead and say, I'm gonna upgrade all of my pavement, it doesn't work. All of my bridges, it doesn't work. So you have to strategize where you're gonna spend the money. That is the crucial aspect. We have to look at it. And then the other aspect is, which I didn't get into it, is sustainability. So when I say sustainability, I'm not looking at, okay, I recycled some material, I'm sustainable. Because sometimes we are spending more energy to recycle some of the material. So eventually we'll run out of energy. Okay, so we have to think in that terms of sustainability because if, even if I go ahead and I have the money, I upgrade on 79,000 miles of highway and it was not needed, that means what? I have wasted X amount of natural resources. So that will be also coming into play over here. So basically, the more things you keep on adding, the complex the problem becomes, and then it becomes hard to handle it. Other questions? Yes. So um, I have uh, another question regarding yeah. the um, the resilience, uh, the chart that you showed. Yes. Probably uh, on the maybe last or the second last uh, slide. So my question is, uh, it seems that you can you consider resilience. Um, is composed of uh, several dimensions. Yes. Then, what would be the criteria to, uh, for a resilience metric to identify the importance of each dimension? So which dimension is, is more important than the others? Okay, so then, basically, we are going ahead and saying that we're gonna go ahead and see which dimension becomes important here, right? because these are the technical organizational aspects. Now you can go ahead and take a look at this one as well. Yes. Right? So the question becomes is, that's where you have to come up with some strategy to figure out which one you're gonna give importance. And that's why I said resilient assessment strategy. Now, it, it will depend on the group of people. And that's why I said group decisions, because it will be a collective information. When I say collective information, that means you need to involve MPO. Let's say for the sake of argument, those are the local agencies. You have to involve Federal Highway Administration. You have to involve states. Then you have to involve emergency aspect. So for example, you are trying to create a shelter, right? So you have a Harvey and say, okay, I'm gonna have a shelter here. Now that shelter, may be cut off, just what happened in Katrina, that the people were stuck there. So basically, you can make it as much complex as you want. That's the whole problem is. So for, for now, what I'm saying it is, I'm gonna focus on just the critical infrastructure which I am identifying. I see. Okay, I cannot, basically again, this is a very big complex problem. It's, yeah, it, because many times what will happen is, once you start going there, you may not have a data available. Exactly. 
that's what the problem becomes. So you don't have a data available. You don't have agencies who are willing to cooperate. So let's say you have perfect system. Then electricity went out. Traffic light went away. Right? Then people, they cannot move. Again, it becomes a stop light. Or there is no light, so you need to have enough cops to make sure they are managing traffic. So it's very complex. Yes, so we need to um, also incorporate um, the uh, opinions and um, the expertise from uh, kind of like all stakeholders, all disciplines. Yes. So th that's where the social aspect will come into picture. Yes. Okay, so it, it's, uh, again, you cannot go ahead and just say, okay, I'm going to sit in my office and come up with a strategy. It's not going to work. Okay, plus, as I showed you, the, if you go ahead and look at the coastal resilience, is different. Uh, Oklahoma has tornadoes. Yes. Okay, that's a different aspect. So we have to kind of identify which are the stressors you are having it locally. Yes. And how you have handled in the past, what were the issues, and that has to go ahead and involve in your assessment. So basically, your, your suggestion is that the, the criteria or the metric for resilience would be different based on different locations. Yes, and a stressor. And a stressor, yes. Okay, so you have to go ahead and say uh, that do I'm going to have a flash flooding in Arizona? Then the question is how would you like a kind of like a zone, do the zoning to identify which location is supposed to use which kind of like a, a resilience strategy? Yes, so basically the way it is is like El Paso, we will not have volcano, okay? Arizona will not have volcano, but Hawaii will have it. So that's what you have to go ahead and based on the historical information, you say, we have, so far we have tornadoes in Oklahoma, okay? We don't have, it. so you cannot look for all the aspects, but you can go ahead and say, let's say if I have tornado here, does it seems to be a problem? But that becomes a lower priority, so you're going to give lower weightage to it. Yes. So you're going to identify the weightages, and that's what the assessment strategy will come into picture. We say this stressor has a lower weightage, it has a lower priority. But that doesn't mean that we will be still resilient if something else happens. So if you remember Harvey, what happened is we had a storm, right? And then that storm lingered around. It was not like if you go to, like say, uh, what's the example? If you go to uh, France and go to the museum, right? So Mona Lisa picture is the one everybody wants to see. So there is somebody pushing you, move, move. So we could not tell Harvey, hey, move. You have been here long enough, right? Yeah. So that's what, we don't have a control over it, okay? So that's where the strategy which you're gonna develop you can go ahead and say, if unexpected event like that one happens, what are the alternatives we're gonna go for it? I see. So it's not, I cannot go ahead and say that this is the prescription. It will be a guidance. If you cannot prescribe, it will be impossible. And again, you cannot have a 100% resiliency, okay? That means failure will not occur. So you have to go ahead and say, okay, if the failure occurs, how I'm going to handle it? True. So it's kind of like a list of a whole um, options and scenarios. Yes. I, and that's what, you know, I was looking at scenarios to see what, and that, that's why I like this one, because they went ahead and did some scenarios. So we have to do a lot of simulations of different problems and figure out what happens. Now, again, keep in mind is social aspect changes, meaning people, they behave differently yes. under stress. So that part, I do not know. So that will be another aspect that has to be looked at it, that what people are doing right now, okay? So basically right now, I know people are using Google. So Google says, you have a jam here, follow this road. We start following that one. 
So if 10 people are following, it's okay. But if everybody starts following that road, then it becomes jammed up. Yes, but also people might not choose to follow Google. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, you know, that's what... So then we are in a different zone, right? In the sense, we are... The, the person is saying, I'm not going to follow Google. I'm going to follow my own knowledge. So if you are local, yes. If you are from outside, it becomes very difficult. So that will be another factor that needs to be added in the simulation. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.